We sang this morning, uh, you'll notice from several of our songs, of the Lamb of God. The Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Uh, The Lamb was slain. The Lamb is risen. The Lamb is King and conqueror. And this morning, that's exactly what we're going to look at. So take your Bible and join me in John's Gospel, the Gospel of John. We're going to be in John chapter 1 this morning. In John chapter 1, we see the emergence of John the Baptist. John the Baptist did not write the Gospel of John. That's John the Apostle. Yet John the Baptist is uh, an expected figure, one who is promised from the prophet Isaiah 700 years earlier. A voice of one crying in the wilderness will come. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way for Yahweh, the King of heaven and earth. And that's exactly what John does John prepares the way of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> John is a transitional figure from the Old Testament into the New Testament. The promises of the Messiah who would come. John is now the, the spokesperson, as it were, for our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus' cousin, nonetheless, the son of uh, Mary and Elizabeth. We remember that as Mary came and she was pregnant with Jesus, that John leapt in in Elizabeth's womb because the Savior's come. The one who he's come to prepare the way for is here. And John announces to the people of Israel, repent, turn, The, the Christ is coming. And now John announces this publicly, that he is in fact on the scene. The Lamb of God has come. We will read this morning, chapter 1, verses 19 through 34. It's a big section to try to set our context. We're going to be focused on verse 29 this morning. Hear the warning that this is God's inerrant word. Let's give our special attention to it this morning. John 1, starting in verse 19. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah has said. But they had been sent from the Pharisees. And they asked him, Then why are you baptizing? If you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet. John answered them, I baptize with water. But among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained upon him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, This is He who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. This is the Word of the living God. Let's pray and ask His blessing. Uh, Father, we do thank You that we have uh, immediate access to Your Scriptures. uh, That those saints of old longed to see and to hear the things that we have right in front of us. So, Lord, we pray and and we beg of you this morning, uh, send your Spirit into our hearts. Uh, Help me to proclaim this truth of the Lamb of God, that we may worship you, both now and forever. We ask 
In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> well, what do you think of when you think of a hero? A hero. If I were to ask you to describe, uh, what does a hero look like to you? How would you describe that hero? What would he look like? What would he say? What would he do? You'd say that no doubt he's someone who's brave and, and courageous. Someone like who's out of a, of a movie. Uh, a, a superhero type of person. A, a, a brave man. A valiant man. A, a good looking man, I'm sure. This man would cause us to, uh, to, to stand boldly because we're under the wings of the hero. But that, we, we, we would see this hero as, as a lion of sorts, someone who, who doesn't need to be defended. He can defend himself. Just let the lion out of the cage. He doesn't need anyone to look after him. He can look after himself. That's how we would describe a hero. But that's not how we see the Lord come. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Yes and amen. And he will trample underfoot his enemies. But we see him coming through the incarnation not as a lion, but as a lamb. We see him coming humbly. He's not exalted, but he's lowly. He's not born in a palace on top of a hill. He's born in a stable in Bethlehem. A lamb is, is weak. A lamb is helpless. A lamb needs protection. A lamb needs someone to look after him, to, to care for him to make sure that the, the wolves and the lions don't come after him. He can't survive on his own. This is the picture that we see of Jesus in his incarnation. He comes a, as a lamb. He comes humbly. He, he comes lowly. He comes to save. Let's behold the Lamb of God. The, the first uh, admonishment that we have is a call to acknowledge who this Lamb is, to acknowledge our need for this Lamb, that He, in fact, has come. Verse 29 uh, says that, that John says, Behold, behold the Lamb of God has come. Uh, this is an imperative command. This is, you better wake up. You better open your eyes, because He's here. He's right here. And you notice that, that John says he was, he was in the crowd. There's one right among you and you don't even know that He's there. The spiritual blindness and, and darkness of the hearts of the people of Israel, even our own hearts today, we need to be shaken awake. Behold, the Lamb of God has come. The Jews in Jesus' day, they needed to acknowledge this. They've been waiting 700 years since Isaiah's prophecy. It's been 400 years of darkness. There, there's been no revelation. There, there's been uh, no major uh, prophetic uh, revealing of God's intentions to save. The prophet, remember they asked, are you the prophet? They've been waiting for the prophet that, that Moses talked to them, would rise up from among them, among the crowd of the people. The king that was promised to David. The Messiah. The Lamb. The Anointed One has been promised. And they don't even see that He's right there. And, and, and John calls them, Wake up! And see that He's here among you. The time is here. We've been waiting. Behold, the Lamb of God has come. In Matthew 26, <clears throat> it, Jesus is called before the Sanhedrin. So He's been in His public ministry for three years, and, and now the time has come. He's finally uh, racked up enough, enough blasphemy in the eyes of the Pharisees that we've had enough. We're taking Him to the Roman governor. They're going to put Him to death. Matthew 26, He's brought forward, and they're, they're charging Him, and they're, answer, they're, they're demanding an answer from Him. Who are you? How dare you say the things that you've said? We've heard accounts of your miracles. You're, you're claiming to forgive sins. You're claiming that, that you will raise yourself from the dead? Answer. Answer us. In Matthew 26, we see the high priest. The high priest says to Jesus, I, I, I adjure you, tell me who you are. You've been saying things. We've, we've heard 
things. It's, it's like the telephone game. We, we're not exactly sure what we've heard. Are, are these true or not? So he says, you tell us who you are. He puts him on the spot. He's, he's on trial. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. There's no more uh, trying to dip and dodge. There's no more avoiding the question, right? We think of that in our lives sometimes. When, when we're asked maybe a question we don't want to answer, we try to get out of that and change the subject. He puts Jesus right on the spot. Tell us who you are. Are you the Christ? We've been waiting for 700 years. Is it you? Now, in this, uh, in this specific verse, uh, this word, behold, is, is from the Greek, ide. Uh, this is what it means, to, to look, to, to behold, to acknowledge. It's not used in this translation, but it's in the Greek. Uh, this man rips his clothes when he hears Jesus' response. Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man, seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Does that sound familiar to you? The Son of Man coming in the clouds with power, seated at the right hand. That's Daniel's prophecy. Daniel 7. One like the Son of Man will come. This is God in human flesh will come. And Jesus says, that's me. And you're not going to see me again until I come at the end in judgment. It's as if He ups the stakes. Now, I'm not just uh, someone who's claiming these things. I'm going to up your ante. You've put me on the spot. Am I the Christ? Am I the Son of God? Yes, I'm, I'm the Son of God and the Son of Man. I'm the promised one. And then the priest responds in verse 65. Then the priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do you need? You have now heard this blasphemy. He's been caught red-handed, as it were. The horse's mouth, so to speak, has spoken. I am the Christ. I am the Son of God, the Son of Man. I am God in flesh. Again, this word is not translated in most translations of this passage, but in terms of a reference for behold, there's nothing more, uh, more clear that could be expressed here. The sense of rage that the man has, he's furious, he, he tears his robes. Remember, we've talked about how that's a sign of grief, a sign of anger. He rips his robes. How dare this man claim to be the Son of God? It's the same call here. How obvious can it be, John says? He's right here. Wake up and acknowledge who he is. Behold, Behold, the Lamb of God. I think this word, um, this word is translated in some ways, uh, especially when it's at the beginning of a sentence, which it is here. Uh, it means you can't miss this point. You have to understand what's being said. It's not a, it's not a kind of a slide in somewhere. This is, this is an exclamation point. This is an all caps, bold message. Behold. Acknowledge who I'm speaking about, Jesus, the Lamb of God. You can't miss this. You can't be wrong. But I think uh, in terms of this, this looking and waking up, um, uh, the sequoias. I just, I just can't stop talking about the sequoias. We're out here in California. And when we went to the sequoias, I kept saying, would you look at that? Can you, can you believe that, the size of that tree? This is amazing. You, you can't miss this. Open your eyes. Take a picture, but it won't do it justice. Pay attention to, to God's glory and creation. That's what John is saying. You can't miss this. The Lamb of God has come. He's been promised. And He's here. Wake up and see Him. Behold, He's right in your midst. Don't miss Him. That's our call for today. That's your call for today. Behold, behold the Lamb of God. The Lord Jesus has come to take away the sins of the world. You need to acknowledge your need for this forgiveness. That God has provided one way and one way only 
through His Son for the forgiveness of sins. Behold, exclamation point, wake up, look, the Lamb of God. It's finally come. He's finally here. Think of uh, family. We have some family who spread out around the country, and, and every time they come home, we think, look, they're finally here when they pull in the drive when we're so excited. Finally, our, our brother or our uncle or, or mom and dad are finally home. Finally, John says, he's here. He's here. Behold. <clears throat> and next we need to look at who, who do we behold? We are to behold. We are to look. We're all to, we are to acknowledge. But, but who are we to acknowledge? What's so important about this man? This is the Lamb of God. I'd like you to flip in your Bible to Exodus 12. Exodus 12. <clears throat> now the Jews of this, uh, of this time were very familiar with the Lamb. They knew the importance of the Lamb. They knew how significant it was, the shedding of the blood of the Lamb. God had reminded them again and again and again I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. Of course, we remember right before they're sent away, it was initiated the Passover, the shedding of the blood of the Lamb. And that's what separated the people of Egypt from the people of Israel. Those who were to, to die and those who were to be saved, to be delivered. Exodus 12. I want to read verses 21 through 23. This is, this is after all of the plagues and Pharaoh's heart is still hardened and he won't let the people go and finally God says, I'm going to do something that they'll never forget. Behold, in a way, watch what I'm going to do. I am going to send more weeping from, I from Egypt that will never happen again. There will never be more tears shed in Egypt than what I'm going to do in this plague. Then Moses called to the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs, lambs for yourselves, according to your clans, and kill the Passover lamb. Then take a bunch of hyssop and dip it, dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of, your door, of the door of his house until the morning, because the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. That's the initiation of the, the slaughtering of the lamb. This is it. This is what the people have been remembering. The people have been bringing to mind. Remember what God has done. And what was it that separated them from the people of Egypt? It was the blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb. When the, when the destroyer, the angel of death, saw the blood, he couldn't go in and strike because the Lord said, you will not go in. They're covered by the blood of the Lamb. And that's the call. To be covered by the blood of the Lamb. If they weren't covered under the blood, the firstborn died. There was no negotiation. There was no second chance. You go into your house, you stay in. If you have the blood, you're safe. The blood of the Lamb is what separates those who live and those who die. The Passover was celebrated by the Jewish people. This was a big deal. They, they would travel from all over the world, everywhere that they were spread out, to celebrate the Passover. We celebrate Christmas and Easter, right? And we see our families come. If, if we're fortunate enough to experience that, we want to celebrate these big things. When, when Christ has come, and then ultimately when Christ has died and resurrected, we celebrate these things. We need to be reminded of these things. And the Jewish people were the same way with the Passover. We need to remind ourselves of what we celebrate at the Passover. I, th I think it's so amazing to, to begin the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. 
What does God say? I've already delivered you from Egypt. That's the basis. I've already delivered you. Now walk accordingly. It's not you need to follow all of these rules and then I'll save you. Because I've already shown my mercy to you. Remember what I've done for you in Egypt. I've delivered you out of the hand of Pharaoh. Now walk accordingly. Walk accordingly because of what I've already done. We can't get these out of order. We believe the gospel. We're covered by the blood of the Lamb. We're delivered from Egypt that's sin and Satan. And then we walk accordingly out of a thankful heart for what He's done. This is why we tell our children about Christmas and Easter. What do we really celebrate? What what, what do you tell your grandchildren? What's the real meaning? It's great to be gathered with friends and family. I'm going to be honest, I love getting Christmas presents too. But that's not what it's about. Christ has come. Behold, the Lamb of God has come. We want to keep Christ in Christmas. The Jews wanted to keep the lamb in the Passover meal. We can't forget the lamb. We can't forget the significance of his shed blood. We need to remember the Passover. We need, just like we need to remember Christ in Christmas. We need to remember the lamb's blood at the Passover celebration. We need to be reminded of God's mercy. How God's delivered us. What God has done for us. Remember this. God's delivered them from Egypt. They didn't ever want their children to forget, but unfortunately they did. Our call is to to behold and to acknowledge that this Lamb has come, to remember that the Lamb of God has come. Without a slain Lamb, what happens? What happens to the household who doesn't cover their doorposts in blood? firstborn dies. There's no mercy at that point. Mercy's offered to them. Sacrifice the lamb. Get covered under the blood of the lamb. And you will be saved. You will be spared. But when the angel came through, there was no more second chance. They had to be under the blood. And the Lord says there will never be a cry from Egypt like the cry that came at the Passover. Imagine the Pharaoh in his, in his high and lifted throne and defying the God of Israel when he finds out his son is dead. He wasn't under the blood. He wasn't under the blood. He wasn't, he wasn't spared. He didn't heed God's warning. The Lamb's blood saved the people of Israel. What we ought to note here as well, as John is saying, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Who is it that needs their their sins taken away? It's only a sinner who needs his sins away. It's only a sinner who needs forgiveness. That's why John has been preaching. Repent. Turn from your sin. Acknowledge your sin. And throw yourself on the provision that God's provided in Christ. That's the call of John. That's the call of Jesus. I'd rather you come to me and be forgiven than to face my wrath. And that's our call. To acknowledge our sin and our need of forgiveness. As As I've written sermons, I find it so simple in a way that it's the same story every time. I don't know if you've noticed that, but, but my goal is to give you the same story, no matter what the text is, the same story. God is holy and righteous and will not allow sin into His presence. That's a problem for you. That's a problem for me. A sin in the Greek is an archery term that, that you, you aim at a target and you miss. And God only accepts a perfect bullseye, and you don't have it. 
I don't have it. No matter how hard we may try to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps, we'll never make it. Can you acknowledge that this morning? That you swung and you missed. That you shot and you were off target. God only accepts perfect righteousness. You have been found in the balances. You've been weighed in the balances and found wanting, found lacking. Can you acknowledge that today? Where is your heart? Can you acknowledge that? I had a conversation just this morning about how we ought to be so humble that, that we're just as bad as anyone else because we look in the heart. We, we need to examine our hearts. God looks upon our heart. That we see sin in the heart way down deep as a part of our fallen nature by children, by nature, children of wrath. This lamb is only meant for those who can acknowledge that they're in Egypt, so to speak. That they're, they're in Satan's dominion. He's the God of this age, the prince of the power of the air. Egypt is a representation for Satan, allegorically speaking, just as Babylon is. The people needed to be saved from Egypt. It's been 400 years. God, deliver us from Egypt. Deliver us from the hand of our enemies. And God says, I'll give you a lamb. I'll give you the blood of the lamb. And I'll deliver you from Egypt. We need to understand as well in the Old Testament context the standard of the lamb. God doesn't say go grab some cheap uh, lamb that you can pick up anywhere that's at a discounted rate, that, that's a little off, that, that doesn't look all that great. Just get a cheap lamb. He doesn't do that. He says get a blameless lamb. Get a spotless lamb. Lamb. Get the best lamb that you can find. And as John says this about Jesus, what is he saying? The lamb's got to be blameless. He's saying Jesus is blameless. Jesus is sinless. He has no stain of sin or iniquity. That's a bold statement to say, isn't it? He has no sin to be forgiven. And Paul tells us this as well. He who knew no sin, God made to be sin for us. There was no guile or deceit that was found in his mouth. He's the sinless one. He's the only one who doesn't have a stained garment of sin. This is also a claim of his, his supremacy, his, his glory. Only Jesus is without sin. He's the only one who can get to the throne. The only one who has the right to go into the Holy of Holies. The sinless one. God will not take a tainted, dirty sacrifice. So this sacrifice has to be pure. That's what John's telling us. He is the Lamb of God. He is the pure one, the undefiled one. He's our substitute. As we look at the Lamb, why? Why does He come? Why does the Lamb come? Why are we in such desperate need? Why do we need to acknowledge? Why does He tell the people, Behold, wake up and look at the Lamb? Why was Jesus, why did Jesus come down incarnate? He's worshipped by millions of angels without sin in His presence. And He comes down and He's born in a barn. He's born as a, as a carpenter's son. There's, there's nothing special about him. Remember Isaiah said his, his appearance gave us no reason to even look at him. Our pictures of Jesus, I've heard a, a pastor say, are so wrong. Because we have Jesus with flowing locks and, and, and he's white-skinned and blue-eyed. and That's not the Jesus of the Bible. He's just an average Joe, so to speak. He's, he's come humble and lowly. He's come to save. Why would He come to be so humiliated? He's come to, to take away sins. He's come to make a way for you and for I. He's come to make a way for sinners. To come into the presence of God. To take our sins away. 
all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That, that includes you and that includes me. Can, can you agree with that this morning? Can you acknowledge only a hungry beggar goes to find bread and only a broken sinner goes to find forgiveness? Can you acknowledge that, that, that you don't meet the standard? It's really that simple to acknowledge our sin that we didn't make it, and that we need God's grace. And He's provided that in Jesus. Another picture of the Lamb from the Old Testament that the Jews would be so familiar with. As soon as you speak of the Lamb, they go to the Passover. They go to the shedding of blood. They go to the deliverance from Egypt. I think they also would go to the Day of Atonement. This is, these are the sacrifices provided. These would be in their minds. Uh, these would be constantly before them as they acknowledge their own sin and go to the priest to offer their sacrifices. They would also be thinking of the Day of Atonement. This is from Leviticus 16. As God lays out the one day when the priest can go into the Holy of Holies with the shedding of blood and the scapegoat. Remember the story of the scapegoat? See, we think of the scapegoat, uh, and, and rightly so, as someone who can kind of take the blame. Right? You think of a, of a corporate office who's under uh, pressure. And there's there's uh, disagreement in the books. There's, there's some kind of laundering. There's some kind of illegal stuff going on. And somebody takes the fall. And all the blame goes on this guy. It's, it's this guy's fault, not ours. He's the scapegoat. He takes the blame. He takes the punishment. He takes the guilt. And everyone else can go free. And that's what we see on the Day of Atonement. The scapegoat. It says here that the goat shall bear all the iniquities, all of the iniquities of the people on itself, and take it to a remote area. It'll be sent out, driven away from the people. Take our sins away. He shall go free in the wilderness. So these sins are transferred to this goat. And He takes their sins away. They're gone. When the sins are transferred to the goat and the goat is driven away, He takes all the sins with Him. I think in this context of a, of a donkey, being loaded down as he's going on a, on a traveling journey, or when you read the stories of Abraham and Lot separating and they load up their camels and their donkeys and they, and they go far away to separate, to separate, Loading these donkeys down. Loading the sins upon the goat who would take them away. We just recently helped uh, friends and family move. <clears throat> Some friends move, rather. And they, they came from Pennsylvania. He graduated from seminary and they moved out here. He's pastoring here locally. And we met him at the U-Haul place. And I remember seeing this big shipping container. And that thing was stuffed to the gills. I thought, well, it's not going to take us that long. And then he opened the thing. I thought, oh boy, we're going to be here for a while. They took every precaution. It was like they were playing Tetris, right? They were trying to get as much stuff into that container as they possibly could because their stuff needed to be moved. It needed to be taken away. It can't stay here anymore. It's got to go. In the same way, we can see metaphorically that all of the sins have been laid upon this goat. Your sins and my sins. And it's driven away. But these are all just symbols. These are all just types and shadows. This is all looking forward, longing for the day when the true Lamb would come. Does the blood of bulls and goats actually take away sin? No. No. It's all looking forward to the one who would come, who like a lamb, God in flesh, only God could bear the weight of all of that sin and bear the wrath of God due to that sin. It points us to Jesus. And those people for so long have been wondering, when will the lamb come? They can offer sacrifice, but it's only a temporary fix. I need true forgiveness. 
I need once for all my sins to be gone. Now as they driv- drove this goat out into the wilderness, it says that it's, it's gone. It just it goes. How far away does this lamb take our sins? Not just down the road. Not just across the country. As far as the east is from the west, our sins go on Christ. I think it's interesting to note that there's a north pole, the most north you can go, and there's a south pole. Once you go so far north, you hit the north pole, now you're going south. There's, there's a certain point that you can go north and you can go north no more. But there's no east and west. That's forever and ever and ever. You can go east and west forever and never turn back. That's the way the Lord describes His forgiveness for His people. Forever away, as far as the east is from the west. No animal can atone for sin. Bulls and goats are just shadows. And no man can atone for the sin of himself or for any other man. We need a perfect sacrifice. And that's the Son of God Himself, as John tells us, and as Jesus testifies, and as Peter testifies, and as Paul testifies, there's one who can take away sins. And that's our Lord Jesus. Turn one more time with me to Hebrews 9. The book of Hebrews, whether you want to argue over it was written by Paul or Someone else, I'm not here for that at this moment, but the book of Hebrews is written to the Jewish people to stop trusting in the old covenant, the old sacrificial law, the ceremonial law, because we have one who's better than all of that, better than the priests, better than the prophets, better than the sacrifices, better than all the means to try to attain righteousness. The fulfillment is in Christ. Hebrews 9, I want to start in verse 11. Hebrews 9, verse 11. They're looking forward to these sacrifices and preparations and how the high priest needs to go in and, and prepare the people for their sins to be forgiven only in theory, only metaphorically, only only by faith looking forward to the ultimate sacrifice that's in Jesus. And here we see the fulfillment. Hebrews 9. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, He entered once for all into the holy places. Let me stop right there. Only the high priest enters the holy place one time with the shedding of blood once a year. But King Jesus goes right in and sits down in the place of honor. Not by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of His own blood, thus securing a temporary redemption? No, an eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God. Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Christ is better than all of the Old Testament sacrifice. It's only leaving the people desiring for more. I need something better. I need something eternal. I need forever forgiveness and redemption. And that's what John says. The Lamb of God has come. He's here once and for all. Now while you're there in Hebrews 9, if you have a pencil and you don't mind writing in your Bible, I want you to do this. Verse 12. Jesus entered once for all into the holy places. Now that's once for all, meaning there's one sacrifice forever. He's not getting back on the cross It is finished, he said. That's forever, now and into eternity. But right here, the word all. He entered once for all. You can put your name right there. 
He entered once for me. He entered once for me and established an eternal redemption for me. This is a personal redemption. This is a personal sacrifice. This is for all individuals to acknowledge that Jesus has come to save to the uttermost those who call upon His name. As we close, a couple of imperatives I want you to hear as you leave here. Number one is behold. Behold. Look. Open your eyes to the Lamb of God who's come. As Jesus was right in the midst of the people, that's what John says. He's right within you and you don't recognize Him. He came to His own and they didn't recognize Him. They rejected Him. But to those who received Him, He gave the right to become children of God. Behold. Acknowledge. Look to the Son who's come. Look to the Lamb of God who was slain. That's your call. It's by faith alone in His works. Look to Him and have your sins taken away. Behold. Secondly, believe. Believe. View this personally. That this counts for me. That God has come for me. If you were the only person alive, Christ still would have came for you. Believe it. Believe that God has displayed His mercy and love and grace on the cross in saving even you, Christian. And lift your head. Believe it. Christ has come for me. We have an identity crisis in this country, in this world. People struggle to have, find some kind of value within themselves. And, and, and well, maybe if I make more money, I can be identified as a rich man and I'll be at peace. Or maybe if I can build a bigger house, I can identify as a, a man with, with wealth and power and prestige, and, and then I'll be happy. Find your identity in Christ with your sins forgiven and washed away forever. Believe. Even with a simple faith, believe. Because our salvation doesn't depend on the strength of our faith. It depends on His goodness and His promise. Believe, weak as it may be, that Christ has come to save even me. And lastly, I want to give you this warning. Be prepared. Be prepared. <clears throat> Satan has a good memory. He has a really good memory. All the sins you can't even remember, he remembers. Remember the psalmist praying at times, Lord, forgive me for unseen sins that I don't even know I've committed, even accidental sins that I've committed. But Satan remembers your sin, remembers my sin. And what does he do? He's the accuser. And he'll come along and he'll whisper, Oh, oh, you? No, no, no. Jesus didn't come. For, you're too much. Or may, maybe Jesus gave you half a chance and, and you've out -sinned that level of grace. Oh, not for you, Christian. After all this time, you're going to fall in that way? He's the accuser of the brethren. He'll accuse you of sin. Now there's a point, as the book of Hebrews talks about our conscience being purified and cleansed ultimately by the blood of Christ. There is a call, though, however, to acknowledge our conscience as we walk the Christian life. To acknowledge when we have sin, when the Spirit of God convicts us of sin, that we, we go back and stay in that fountain of cleansing blood, that we confess our sins and receive the forgiveness. But that's not what Satan does. He wants you to fall. He wants to get into your mind. There's no way after you've done that that God can forgive you. What do we see here? Jesus takes away the sin of the world. You can write your name there too. He takes away my sin. Jesus has taken it away. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? If Christ has paid for my sin, there's nothing else to pay for. If He's taken them away, they're not here anymore. They're in the depths of the sea. 
And when the accuser comes, plead this. The Lamb of God has taken away my sins. The Lamb of God has invited me into the Holy of Holies as my elder brother. His blood has paid for my sin, not me. Not the blood of bulls and goats, not, not, not by the merits of my, my good works, not because I gave more money in church because I sinned a little bit more this week. No, the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. Remember that. Remember that. So what did the Jews celebrate on the Day of Atonement? What did the Jews celebrate at the Passover? They didn't celebrate their goodness. They didn't celebrate their um, worthiness, as it were, within themselves. They celebrated the Lamb. They celebrated the blood of the Lamb. They celebrated God's mercy. And that's offered to you. That's what you ought to celebrate. Though my sins are many, His mercy is more. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank You for Your eternal plan of forgiveness. And I pray, O oh God, that our hearts today would behold the Lamb who was slain. Help us, Lord, as we leave this place to preach the Gospel to ourselves from morning until night, that we would plead the merits of His blood, not our own, that You would comfort us, that You would help us to celebrate the risen Lamb who is also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Be with us as we go out, O God. In Jesus' name.